Hey everyone, welcome, welcome. My name is Anne Marie Bastano, and I'm the host for today's webinar. Hi, and welcome to the Animal Legal Defense Fund's Animal Law Academy. Today, we're talking about passing local legislation, retail pet sale ban. We will have Q&A uh, at the end of the presentation. You'll notice along the bottom of your screen that there is a Q&A box where you can enter your questions. We also have additional resources for this webinar that are available on our website. The website address is aldf.org forward slash webinars. You'll also notice that there is closed captioning available. Uh, look for that as well on the bottom of your screen. So let's get started. Joining us today are campaigns manager Matt Russell and campaigner Abby Benish. As campaigns manager, Matt inspires and engages our supporters to participate in our work and increases our success throughout the organization. Abby is responsible for increasing supporter engagement through outreach, relationship development, and management, and drafting campaign related content. Thank you both so much for sharing your time and wisdom with us today. I am going to go away now and I'll pop back up later for the Q&A. So take it away, Abby and Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today. My name is Abby Benish. As Anne-Marie said, I am a campaigner with the Animal League of the Funds Fund, and I'm also a licensed attorney. This webinar is going to cover two very important topics. First, we will discuss puppy mills, and then we're going to move into fighting puppy mills using retail pet sale bans and how to pass a ban in your community. And even if you're not interested in passing a retail pet sale ban or one already exists in your state or community, this webinar includes tools that are important for passing any local animal protection legislation and will still be important. So this is our roadmap for today's webinar. We're going to be covering the importance of local legislation in animal protection the issue of puppy mills and how retail pet sale bans can be used to fight back, the legislative process generally, and then Matt will talk about how to pass laws at the local level. So first things first, why local legislation? Local legislation provides an opportunity to impact countless animals in your community, and it builds the foundation for state and federal laws to pass later. For example, California was the first state to pass a statewide retail pet sale ban in 2017, but nearly 230 cities, towns, and counties have first passed bans. And there may be some laws that may not make sense to pass at the local level. For example, because interstate transport is regulated at the federal level, it probably wouldn't make sense for us to spend our time to pass laws regulating interstate transport of wild animals. So puppy mills. Puppy mill is a term that refers to a large scale commercial breeding facility where the emphasis is placed on profits over the health and well being of the animal. Their goal is to produce the largest number of puppies as quickly as possible. The dogs are generally kept in crowded, unsanitary conditions and lack adequate amounts of quality food, clean water, and do not have access to vet care. The mother breeder dogs may give birth to multiple litters per year throughout her adult life. And she and the aging father dogs will then likely be abandoned or killed when they're no longer useful to their breeders. It's not uncommon for families to purchase dogs that are sick or become very sick shortly after adoption. These poor families may spend hundreds to thousands of dollars on vet expenses, and the sad reality is the puppy may not end up surviving. Retail pet sale bans are one way we can actually fight back against puppy mills. These bans prohibit stores from selling dogs, cats, and sometimes other animals, and instead encourages partnerships with local shelters and rescues to display adoptable animals. So these bans do three really important things. First, they reduce the supply and demand for puppy mill animals. Second, they reduce financial incentives for mill operators. And third, they encourage adoption to combat the overpopulation issues that are plaguing our country shelters. These bans have been gaining serious momentum in the last several years. Currently over 400 cities and counties, including Dallas, Atlanta, and Boston are equipped with a ban, and six states have successfully passed a statewide ban. That's California, Maine, Maryland, New York, Washington, and Illinois. In response to these re retail pet sale bans, pet store lobbyists are pressuring state legislatures to pass preemption laws that block a city or a county's right to adopt retail pet sale bans. 
This is unfortunately a common tactic employed by lobbyists to impede local laws. So basically when a local law conflicts with the state law, the state law preempts or will take precedence over that local law. Pest or lobbyists claim these laws are necessary to ensure there are uniform laws across the state. However, in reality, puppy mill preemption laws simply rob cities and counties of the ability to pass laws that their residents want. Today, despite opposition from animal advocates, Arizona and Ohio have passed preemption laws, but hope is not lost because in states like Georgia and Florida, these preemption bills have successfully been blocked by advocates. Before we continue, we're gonna take a quick poll. The question is, what has been your level of involvement in local legislation up to this point? A, I've never worked on local legislation. B, I've sent emails or made phone calls, that's about it. C, I have attended meetings and testified, or D, I am currently working on and or have successfully passed local legislation in my community. And I'll give everyone a moment to vote. Okay, cool. So it looks like 16% of you have never worked on local legislation. Thanks for being here. 53% um, have sent emails or made phone calls and that's about it. That's amazing. 18% uh, have attended meetings and testified equally as amazing and are currently working on and or have successfully passed legislation. 12% of you. That's awesome. And I'm so happy that you're all here and we can learn together. Okay, so when we're talking about the legislative process, there's a few things we want to consider before we're taking action. First is easy. Where do you live? You want to make sure you're operating in the correct jurisdiction and following appropriate procedure. And along that same line of thinking, we want to figure out who your representative is. If you're not sure, you can find this information out online with a quick Google search of who is my representative. This is really important because representatives are most likely to take the time to listen to their own constituents and your time's really important. Lastly, you'll want to become familiar with how your legislature passes laws and get comfortable with that process. And a great way to do this is to attend a town hall or a city council meeting. When it comes to actually passing legislation, there are two key components that we're going to talk about today. The first is citizen lobbying, which is meeting directly with legislators and their staff. And the second is using grassroots advocacy, which is getting the local community involved through calls, emails, and maybe testifying at a city hall meeting during the process. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Matt and he's gonna talk a bit more about each of these. Hello everyone. Hi, my name is Matt Roselle and I am the campaigns manager here at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. I want to just let you know, I was really excited to see all the interest in this webinar. Thank you so much for being here. From my experience working on local legislation, really is one of the most effective ways that animal advocates can make a lasting change for animals. Uh, it's good to be aware, local legislation isn't necessarily a quick and easy thing to do. You can usually expect uh, it to take several months to even more than a year to accomplish from beginning to end. I have seen some of them move very quickly, um, but in general, expect this to be a longer term project. However, you're already here. You've taken the first step today. And if you just keep taking the next step with a willingness and a desire to uh, learn the process, you really can work on passing a retail pet sale ban or whatever animal protection ordinance makes sense in your community. So all the hard work really does pay off in the end. Um, so let's get, let's get into it and talk about some of the basic steps and tools. So one of the most important things to remember um, in citizen lobbying, lobbying is it is about building relationships. To gain the support of legislators, it's important to build solid uh, professional relationships with them, one of mutual respect. Um, always stay positive and professional. Remember that you're working with elected officials in your community to solve a problem together. And the first step um, is really you need to find a sponsor. So um, the sponsor is the legislator who's going to introduce your ordinance and bring it forward in whatever the formal process is in your local council. 
So once introduced, um, the ordinance really becomes that council member's issue. They will have a personal stake in ushering the ordinance through the process and convincing their colleagues uh, to support it. And your role will be to help educate the council and provide evidence why they should support it and to demonstrate that there's a really strong um, sentiment in the community and, and the community wants to see this pass. So how do you find a sponsor? Well, you're gonna do your homework and you're gonna look at who in that elected body in your community is an animal ally. And you can do this by attending council meetings. You can also look at legislators' websites, find out what legislation they have championed and look at the issues that are close to their heart. Maybe someone on the council has passed an environmental um, ordinance like a grocery bag ban or spearheaded improvements at the local shelter or some other socially conscious effort. Um, once you figure out who you're going to ask, you need to call or email their office and um, ask for a meeting. And Abby, you can go ahead and switch slides. Um, so let's talk a little bit about meeting with legislators. Um, one place to always start is you can just ask your own representative to introduce the legislation. You are their constituent and they're elected to represent you, so that's never a bad place to start. However, you may have found a good reason to start with another council member. One thing to know when you um, request a meeting is you may be directed to meet with a member of their staff instead of with the representative. Please do not be put off by that. This is very common at all levels of government. You should trust that if you make a good impression and a convincing argument with that staff person, that that information will be passed along positively to the representative. And um, building relationships with those staff members really goes a long way to pass legislation. These are the people who work behind the scenes and have the most contact and influence over the legislators. So um, after you secure a meeting, you want to prepare for a successful meeting. First things first, dress appropriately, um, like you're attending a business meeting. Be prepared with a clear, concise summary of both the problem and the solution. And you wanna have your direct ask for that meeting, which is really just, what are you asking the legislator to do? Your first meeting might just be asking them for their opinion about uh, whether the ordinance might uh, work at this, at this point in time in your local government. You might be asking them to sponsor, uh, whatever that is. Later on your meetings, you're gonna be asking legislators to support the legislation once you get it introduced. Um, you may wanna bring sample language with you, which is just the language of the law that's passed in other communities to show as an example. Often legislators are more willing to pass something that, um, or to put forward something in their um, community when other communities have already done so. And you're going to want to bring a fact sheet and a frequently asked questions or FAQ sheet with you. Um, a fact sheet is just a one-sided, very simple, direct uh, page that communicates your most basic points. And then an FAQ is sort of a more longer document that answers the questions that are likely to come up or that the opposition might bring up. And, and uh, that's a good way to inoculate the council against what the opposition is gonna say. So you can do that before they even have a chance to make their arguments. Please take advantage of the fact sheet and the FAQ that we have on our website. These are for you to use and um, you're more than welcome to. And you might wanna supplement that with information that's more relevant specifically to your community, whatever, whatever you need to do. You'll wanna definitely cite sources and establish credibility. As advocates, really, I believe our integrity is our most valuable asset. You wanna be seen when you go to that, to that elected body, you wanna be seen as the person who always brings reliable information. 
And you know, that's the reputation you want to strive for. Uh, video and photographs sometimes are extremely effective in these meetings. Um, I would encourage you to use a very short video clip um, that just sort of like illustrates the problem to kind of set the tone of the meeting and show the importance. A few, a few pictures and uh, a short video clip can really go a long way to drive home your message. You also want to be sure to use non-animal arguments. Um, for retail pet sale bans, think cost savings. You know, for city shelters, the city is going to spend less money if more animals are getting pulled out of the shel shelters and adopted through these partnerships uh, at the pet stores. Or you might want to argue about um, consumer protection from puppy mill fraud. Some jurisdictions just may be less interested in the animal issues and more in protecting um, members of the community. And finally, you'll wanna have an opportunity to tell your personal story. Connect it back to you know, what motivated you to do this. Are you um, someone who has been protesting at a local pet store that has a terrible reputation? Do you work at a rescue or, or volunteer at the local shelter and you have had personal experiences with the overpopulation issue and, and wanna bring in those experiences and share them, um, whatever it may be, but um, it's always good to, to bring it back to your personal sort of story. And um, our next slide, we are going to talk about some of the best practices for success. It's really important, as I've already mentioned, to stay positive and professional. And this is true even if you're being challenged or dismissed, which is not uncommon, especially at the beginning of a campaign to get pushback from some of these legislative offices. Um, you might have a meeting with a legislator or a staffer who suggests, oh, there's a better way to do this. Why don't you go to the state and try to get them to pass a law? Um, or they may tell you that their office is busy with other priorities. They may also offer advice or suggest another legislator who might be more supportive. Or they might uh, tell you about a, a step in the legislative process that you were unaware of. So always go into these meetings thinking of them as a two-way conversation. You wanna listen, take good notes, and carefully consider advice you might get along the way because it might be really helpful. And then just common sense, treat everyone with respect. When you show an earnest desire to fix this animal protection issue and, you, and you're, it's clear that you're trying to work with, not against the elected body, uh, my experience is doors will open for you and you will start making progress. Uh, you may also get asked a question that you don't know the answer to, never guess. It's perfectly fine to say, I don't know, but I'm, it's a very good question, I'm gonna get back to you. This is really actually a great opportunity to keep the conversation going with that office. So just make sure that you do the research and get back to them with a reply later. And then finally, I wanna say, respect everyone's time and keep the meetings to the original length you agreed upon. Um, you know, as, your life is busy, so are all these professionals, and they have uh, very busy schedules. So be prepared. Uh, it's possible that your meeting might be cut short at some point. Know your issues inside and out so you can keep the meeting short and to the point and make your, uh, all your points, even if you have a short amount of time. And so next, we are going to talk about the legislative process. This is basically, how does an idea become a local law? Well, it's different in every jurisdiction, but there are some general similarities that I'll go over right now. Um, an ordinance is always in some way introduced to the council, and then it is drafted into language that fits the local um, municipal code. At some point, it might get reviewed by a committee, depending on you know, the makeup of your local government. And then finally, we'll go to one or more votes by the full council before uh, being passed. And then 
It may also need to be signed off by the mayor. You know, that's kind of the general process. I am going to share with you a little bit about what happens here in Los Angeles, just to give you kind of a better idea of what kind of a timeline and, and all the ins and outs of what can happen. Um, so here in LA where I live, um, an ordinance gets introduced as a motion. And this is just a document that is usually just maybe even just a short paragraph. It's not yet the legal language of the law. It's mainly just um, the spirit of the law's intent. And this gets presented to the council, gets voted on. This is sort of a low level uh, bar. The, the council is just saying this, we support this idea enough to bring it into this process and discuss it. Um, if, uh, if it's passed, then it goes on to the city attorney to be drafted into the language that will eventually appear in the city code. And that means that it fits in with wherever it um, makes sense for it to go in the current laws and, and uh, to mesh up with what's already on the book. Um, from here, it's referred to as a council file here in LA, and it's assigned to a committee. Typically, it would be the Personnel Audits and Animal Welfare Committee. This is the one that reviews animal protection ordinances for the most part. And that committee is made up of three of the full 15 members of the council. Eventually the item would get um, assigned to a hearing. So it's gonna be brought up in one of the meeting agendas. And this is where the merits of it will be discussed, both pro and con. The public is invited to testify and there will also be opponents arguing against. So you're gonna organize people in favor and be prepared for the opposition as well. Uh, experts may be invited to speak, and as well as city staff, maybe the city attorney will have um, be offered an opportunity to weigh in. And of course, the sponsoring council member will be there to defend the ordinance as well. And um, from this stage, a lot of different things can happen, but often a council member on this committee might ask a city department to do a report. There may be some more questions. And so then the item will be referred to like possibly animal services to do a report. That report will get worked on for a number of weeks or months and then come back to committee for another discussion. Eventually though, um, the committee will decide to vote this out of committee um, and then it will go to the full council for a final vote before the mayor signs it. And another thing to consider at any point in this process, amendments could be proposed. These amendments um, are requests to change the language, maybe to clarify things, but also maybe to um, have a concession or a compromise of some kind. So you have to pay very close attention to who's proposing amendments and for what reason. Sometimes you have to concede some things, but you don't want to obviously lose the intent of the law. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the process you might be looking at. Um, the details, as I've said, are different in every jurisdiction, but you can see it's a multi-step process. Now, it's not that you will be actively working necessarily for the entire time. There, there will likely be periods of downtime where you're just monitoring the status, waiting for something to, to be scheduled. Sometimes there's big gaps of time where the council is just busy with other things. And so you have it's it's often you know periods of waiting with periods of intense activity. Um, I don't say all this to overwhelm you because I want you to know that this can be taken one step at a time. Um, you will be working closely with the sponsoring office who is well versed in the process, and they're a great resource to help you understand what's coming next and and how you can 
you know, best help them keep the ordinance moving forward. So, um, but, but in general, that's kind of how the process might go. And next we are going to discuss using grassroots advocacy. First of all, what is grassroots advocacy? Basically, this involves getting a broad base of community support to engage in the political process to support what you're doing. If you are on the Animal Legal Defense Fund's mailing list, certainly you have probably gotten involved in some grassroots work and you've probably signed some petitions or written uh, emails or letters to legislators. These are all like small actions. I kind of think of them as votes for a certain um, issue. Each individual takes the small action and collectively dozens and hundreds of others um, show lawmakers that there is wide support in favor of this ordinance or whatever the issue is. This type of action really is essential and can lead to the passage or the defeat of a bill or an ordinance. And the three main advocacy tools that we use in grassroots activism that we're gonna discuss are action alerts, social media, and public testimony. So let's get right into it. We'll start with action alerts. Action, action alerts are messages to your supporters asking them to take some action. So it's usually like an email to their legislators or a call on a specific issue. We often send these out to supporters when there's a proposed ordinance or uh, a committee uh, hearing is scheduled or floor vote, whatever, when there's action to be taken. Important to remember for action alerts is to keep your message short, specific and easy for people to do. It's really helpful to include a sample email message or a script if you'd like people to make a phone call. And one of the biggest things you wanna be mindful of is only encourage people to reach out if they live in the appropriate jurisdiction. Legislators are responsible to their constituents, um, but not to people outside of their district. You don't wanna frustrate a legislator flooding them with calls, for example, from people outside the city. Uh, it can be counterproductive. And as you work on a campaign, you're going to want to continually add to your list of people, your contacts that you're reaching out to. So um, make sure that whenever you know a new person shows up at a meeting, you're always getting their contact details so that you can send your alerts out to a larger list and, and ask them for help when you need it. And also coalition building is something worth mentioning. Um, to spread the word further, it's very common in legislative campaigns to um, have coalitions built among local humane groups or local rescues, even um, getting the help of other animal protection organizations that are national. This can help you broaden your reach because when you're sending out an alert, you can ask them to share your alert or share their own alert with similar messaging to their list. So the next tool we need to discuss needs no introduction, social media. I am sure that you're all well-versed in how animal advocates have perfected using social media to reach a large audience and educate people about animal cruelty. There's all various platforms that are used, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and others. And they can be used very effectively with people on local ordinance campaigns to reach new supporters. You can share your action alerts on social media. You can also, for example, Facebook has an event feature where you can invite people to attend a hearing or a council meeting. As always, be kind and address differences and oppositions. We all know how negative sometimes the comments can get on social media. Just know as a leader, you, other people will be looking to you to set an example. And so always stay professional um, and 
fact-based. You wanna monitor those comments, make sure everything is civil. And also um, worth noting, because social media posts get shared widely, it's another good place where you wanna drive home the message for people to only contact legislators if they do live in that jurisdiction. And when you have victories along the way, you can post those victories on social media. It's always great to tag the council members who, who voted, it, voted on it um, in order to give them kind of a public shout out and credit. And you can follow your elected leaders on their social media platforms and find ways to sort of work your ordinance into their conversation. And that's a great opportunity. You can educate people that are following them and continue the conversation in this public forum. And the final tool that I want to discuss is a very powerful one. It is public testimony. And at various stages that we've talked about in the, as your ordinance progresses, there will be opportunities for public comment on your proposed legislation. Testifying presents really the best opportunity for community members to speak directly to legislators. When preparing to testify, you should really prepare about two to three minutes of testimony and keep in mind that it's not at all uncommon sometimes at the last minute for the amount of time that you have in a public meeting to be cut short. So remind people, you know, to kind of know what is their speech gonna sound like if it's cut to two minutes or even one minute and uh, make sure you put all your strongest comments first if that happens. You always wanna introduce yourself, say what district you're from, and state clearly whether you're uh, in favor of the ordinance or if you're speaking against something that is bad for animals, you know, just state your position and then go on to um, explain your reasons why. You always wanna be polite and thank legislators for the opportunity. And um, as an organizer, there are ways to strategize before a public hearing to best utilize this public testimony. Um, I've seen it very effectively used for organizers to coordinate testimony of some of their supporters ahead of time. So instead of having one person after the other get up and kind of have redundant testimony, you can assign different topics to each person so that by the end of the hearing, all your points have been made, but everyone has had something unique to say. And another strategy that I've seen work very well is have one person stand up and just invite everyone in the chambers in the audience to stand up if they support this ordinance. Now this works especially well if you have packed the room because, um, it's really an impressive show of community support. And you might even wanna have everyone wear a similar color, or you might provide them with a sticker to wear that kind of ties everyone together and shows the unity and how you've really brought the community out and how important it is to, to the community that you've packed the, the room. Now that we've talked about the grassroots, um, I want to talk about something called grass tops advocacy. This is a term that describes an individual who has extra influence to mobilize supporters or convince legislators. Pictured here is Billie Eilish and Joaquin Phoenix. They have been supporters of the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and, and recently they, along with a bunch of other uh, celebrities lent their voice to a letter that was supporting a ban in New York City on horse-drawn carriages after a horse named Ryder collapsed in downtown Manhattan. The letter was picked up by some of the media and created news stories that furthered the cause. So your grass tops advocacy need not be all A-list celebrities. Um, Think about 
who in your community or who within your circle of friends and your sphere of influence might uh, know someone who knows the mayor or knows a prominent business owner in the community who might be friends with one of the legislators or maybe a high donor to one of the council members. These high profile people can really play a significant role when used effectively during a campaign. Usually you ask them to do one specific thing. Maybe you'll want them to take a meeting with a legislator who's on the fence or to sign on to an op-ed that gets published in the local paper. It's important then to ask all of your supporters who they might know and have everyone sort of brainstorm who they might know who could play this role as a grass tops advocate. And so before we wrap up, I, I, I wanna talk for a minute about involving uh, youth advocates in your campaign. This is a picture of my daughter, Felix, testifying in front of an LA city council committee when she was nine years old. Um, she was speaking on behalf of wild animals used in traveling shows and circuses. And from my experience, kids can really make a difference in legislative campaigns and don't need to wait until they become adults to participate in the legislative process. I've seen it over and over again where uh, a child you know, or a young adult gets up in front of the mic, in front of a council or a committee, and those, those committee members really play close, play close attention and give high praise to these young, articulate citizens um, who can really cut right to the point and talk about the needs to protect animals. I saw, um, I worked with a group of middle school students in rural Idaho who almost on their own with some adult help got two animal ordinances passed in a very short amount of time because the local councils were just so impressed by them, they just couldn't say no. And um, so just consider what youth advocates you might have in your network and how you might invite them to participate in your campaign. And so finally, after all this effort, it's really important to celebrate the victories. This photo here is uh, from a rally outside the Los Angeles City Hall before the final vote to ban the sale of fur in Los Angeles. This was February of 2018. In the foreground is Council Member Blumenfield and Council Member Kretz. They were both championing this cause. You can see from the background, the community was invited with an action alert, um, signs were provided and t-shirts were given out and stickers to kind of tie everyone together and show solidarity. The media was invited to this event and members of the council and some celebrities and organizational leaders all spoke to get some news stories out just ahead of the vote to create a little bit more pressure uh, on these council members' colleagues to do the right thing. Um, and you can see that that was all done with the backdrop of this huge crowd on the steps of City Hall. So um, this was just ahead of the historic vote. It was, I believe, unanimous in favor. And the following year, the state of California passed a similar statewide ban that went into effect last year. So um, every once in a while, an ordinance campaign is quick and relatively easy, but usually, you know, you can expect it to take some work, but in the end, it is so worth it. And the feeling you get when the final vote is cast or the mayor signs off on your ordinance, making it law, is absolutely an amazing feeling and rewarding feeling of accomplishment to know that you've made a lasting change advancing animal protection in your community. I want to end on this quote. I think it's so perfect for this webinar. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. 
Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And from my experience uh, working on local legislation, I do see this again and again. Don't expect someone else is gonna do it. You might be the advocate who needs to step up and take on this challenge. Even if you're at this point in this webinar where you're curious about possibly working on a local ordinance, I strongly encourage you to follow up on that curiosity. Abby and I are here at the Animal Legal Defense Fund to answer questions uh, ongoing if you start working on a campaign. And in fact, I believe we still have some time to answer some questions right now. But first, um, we're gonna have one last poll question. So after attending this webinar, what is the likelihood you will work on a local legislation to help animals in your community? One, not likely. Two, I'm curious, but not sure if I have the time. Three, yes, I wanna try, but need more information. And four, definitely, I feel like I'm ready to get started. So we'll give that a minute to let you all answer the question. All right. That is, that's a really great, uh, that's a great turnout. We have uh, the majority of people are ready to get started. So that's um, exciting news. And we are here, Abby and I are, are really here to help you do that. So uh, please do reach out to us. Thank you so much for your attention. You can see our email addresses are, are right here, please. Um, copy those down and feel free to reach out to us. And um, why don't we go ahead and use the last few minutes we have here to take some questions right now. Okay, thank you, Matt. And thank you, Abby, uh, for coming back on so that we can have a little Q&A. So we have a lot of questions. Um, uh, the first one, so, does a retail pet store ban have any impact on backyard breeders? The retail pet sale bans are specific to pet stores in your community, which is really the vast number of the uh, puppy mill puppies are sold through those venues. And so it's a really great place to start, but no, it doesn't in fact impact backyard breeders. Okay, thank you. A couple people, a couple, you know, very compassionate people um, want to help out in other states. Let's say your state has a retail ban already, but neighboring states do not. Can you influence legislation in a state you don't live in? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have seen people working in other states. You are, it's probably a, a conversation that we can continue offline because you are going to want to find people locally there that you can um, directly work with. Legislators often wanna hear from their own constituents, but if you have experience passing legislation in your state and you, you know, have you know, a connection elsewhere, uh, there's no reason why you couldn't influence that legislation as well. Okay, thank you, Matt. So in general, how do you even know if a pet store is sourcing from a puppy mill? Well, really, all of these pet stores that we have seen are almost always sourcing uh, from puppy mills. The local, you know, a local breeder is, is going to sell direct to a customer. And so you can pretty much be guaranteed if it's a pet store, then um, they are selling from a puppy mill. Um, some states actually require some of that information to be made public, but just because a, a breeder is licensed by the USDA does not mean that it's not a puppy mill. In fact, they, you know, all these puppy mills are actually licensed uh, by the USDA. And unfortunately, those regulations are 
so weak and under enforced that it does very little to protect animals. So um, yeah, rest assured, they are uh, puppy mill puppies if they're in a local pet store. Yeah, thank you, Matt. That's that's devastating to hear. Um, how can we find out the laws in our own county? Uh, this uh, attendee has tried to look online. It didn't really see anything. Does that mean there's nothing on the books or should this person you know, keep digging? How, do, how does that work? Well, um, every community, every jurisdiction will have their municipal codes online. So it's pretty easy to find the website and even just do keyword searches in that code to pull up um, the animal ordinances. Usually all the animal ordinances will be organized in one place. Um, but if you're having trouble, Abby and I can probably help you offline to, um, to look those up um, without any problem. You can always also just uh, contact the office of your local city council member and ask questions. And it might be just a good place to start a conversation with them. Thank you. Do you think that protests are helpful here in these situations? What I've seen a lot of in communities um, are that protesting a local pet store kind of is, is, sometimes it comes before the ordinance. Like there'll be activists organized around like a pet store where they know that um, sick puppies have been sold from. Maybe you've heard from customers and there's been complaints and um, protests have been happening. And those protests and the, the campaign around that has sort of led to the need for passing a local ordinance. Um, you're certainly not going to be protesting against the city council. You're gonna be working with them to pass the ordinance, but protests do raise public awareness, sometimes gathers, uh, gains media attention and, and legislators, um, you know, they wanna work on issues that are um, important to their constituents. So it can play a role. I would just encourage people Keep your pro protests very peaceful um, and just be careful about your messaging. But protests can, can definitely play a role in these campaigns. Thank you, uh, Matt. Uh, we have a number of questions about like getting a meeting with an elected official and you know how to get a meeting and sort of the approach, the strategy for that. So I'm gonna kind of clump those questions together. Is it more effective to meet with a legislator one-on-one -on -one, or should you go with a group of advocates um, to a city council meeting? I have seen, um, I've seen it be, it can be effective. Uh, there's a lot of, there's no like one answer to that question. I've seen it work effectively. If you have a coalition of people that you're working with, often someone representing each of the groups will want to participate. And then you can coordinate, you know, your, you know, you start to get into a flow of how the meetings go and different people will take on different um, topics. Um, you might want to um, bring someone into a particular meeting because they are uh, in that jurisdiction and maybe you're not. And so you want to have someone that's there, you know, representing that's a, a constituent of that legislator. Um, but really it's just, calling up their office or emailing and asking for a meeting. You wanna be very clear about um, what you want a meeting about and, um, and then just kind of go through the process. Um, in fact, post um, COVID, a lot of these jurisdictions are kind of set up now to have virtual meetings and a lot of things are happening still through, um, you know, um, online meetings like this. Uh, so you may not even have to leave your home to have a meeting with a legislator, uh, or sometimes you'll be meeting in person. It just depends. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Another question about, about meetings. Are you more likely to get a meeting if you first ask to meet with a staffer? Um, this person is in a, a state that is very unfriendly to animals. Uh, well, it's, 
it, it all depends. Yes, I think that it's a, it's a lower bar to ask for a meeting with staff. Um, and you can just, uh, you know, be clear in your, um, in your message, just say, I would really love to meet with council member X, Y, or Z. However, um, I'm willing to meet with anyone in the office just to get the conversation started. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it definitely is very common um, at, like I said, at all levels of government, even, you know, in Congress, all the way down to local city government, um, the staff really, because they're, the legislators are so busy, the staff really do a lot of the direct communication with constituents. And, um, and so, yeah, it might be easier that way. Okay, thank you for those tips. So um, um, this uh, person who's joining us today is in a, you know, sort of a, a difficult situation. Um, and they're asking, what do you do if your local officials don't even respond to you? Um, you've given information, you've reached out, and you just can't get them to bite. Are there any, I mean, that's so difficult, but, you know, what what could someone in that situation do? Well, uh, most, most city councils in the, in their regular meeting have a Usually up front at the beginning of the meeting, there's some kind of public comment period that is isn't directly connected to um, you know the agenda items where anyone from the public can get up and say you know speak for two minutes, and so you might just take that opportunity. You know they're 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 in the meeting, and um, you can present your information to them directly, and then you know maybe if you stick around for the meeting, I really do feel that. Um, the more you are present in, in the meetings, you know, attending meetings and just getting yourself familiar with the process, the more they see that you keep coming back and you're level-headed and you're not getting angry and you keep bringing the evidence and you keep demonstrating how this is important in the community, you start to gain their respect. And so I think it's just a process of you know, persistence. And, um, and also it's good to know like some issues, the timing just might not be right. I mean, you, you might wanna just uh, take a meeting or, you know, like try to find someone on the city council who's willing to talk to you and maybe they'll have some insight and just say, hey, I don't think that this is a good time for this. Maybe after the next election, when the makeup of the council changes, there'll be some different voices on there and some different personalities that might be more inclined to help animals. So um, you just being persistent, I think, is a is a good way to go. Okay, thank you. And you know, I, I wonder what you'll say about this. Do you think it's easier or more difficult um, to get ordinances changed in small communities? in particular, small Southern communities? Um, I, I do think that in general, smaller communities have a simpler process um, to pass ordinances and it can be easier. I've, I've worked with folks in very small communities that kind of everyone knows everyone and um, those opportunities um, might make it a little, a little bit easier uh, because you're going to the city council who knows who you are and, and sort of has a relationship with you outside of just this formal one. Um, so regarding uh, communities in the South, um, I don't know, I mean, I, I've, I've worked with people across the country in very conservative areas from to very progressive areas. And, and really, I do feel like this type of work is possible everywhere. Um, there, it, you know, the need to protect animals crosses all political boundaries. It's not, you know, a democratic issue or a Republican issue or a, a progressive versus conservative issue. You know, we all have 
we all want our communities to be safe for the people and the animals who live there. And, and so I do think that it's possible to pass everywhere. Okay, thank you. Uh, a, a hot tip from Catherine, before you set up a protest, make sure to check your local ordinances around setting up protests. <laughs> um, so uh, that's a good one to consider. Um, Julie writes in that her state does have a total ban with an exemption for um, pre-2021 pet stores. Uh, they're sort of grandfathered in. So would she take a similar path that you've outlined uh, today, Matt and Abby, to try to um, get that current law changed? Yeah, that's uh, exactly right. The, the, it would, you know, it would be a similar process likely. You'd have to check with the local jurisdiction, but I would, I would start by going to the whatever the legislators are who um, were behind and championed that law and kind of follow their lead on whether they think the timing is right for strengthening that law. But really it would require an amendment. And, you know, it, it would be going back and changing that law um, to amend it to apply to all of those pet stores. So, yeah. Okay. Well, let me tell you, we have so many questions. This is really great. What an great engaged crowd. Thank you all. Um, we have time for one more question, um, but I, I did want to mention to everyone that this webinar has been recorded and we're going to share the recording with you later. And um, we do see your questions. So we'll be able to follow up with you privately later. Um, so just thinking about lobbying and how expensive it could be, what if you're um, somewhat financially limited? Can you still, you know, do this work? Definitely. Um, I would say that, you know, an, another tool that we haven't talked about, ballot initiatives, are a very expensive tool because you have to spend a lot of money to pay for all the signature gathering and you have to usually pay for a lot of marketing. But being a citizen lobbyist, um, you're, you know, maybe paid lobbyists are very expensive, but you as a citizen lobbyist, um, it's just your time is, is uh, what the cost is. So if you can afford the time to work on the issue, um, the expense really just comes down to like maybe pr printing costs, and things like that. And you might even be able to find a local or, or national group to help you um, cover those costs. So no, it doesn't have to be an expensive venture at all. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. We promised to only keep you for an hour and we have managed to do so. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking time out. Matt and Abby, thank you so much for all your expert tips. And we'll see you uh, next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.